this is a mixed group, so I'm going to provide some brief notes uh, just to talk about some of the amazing things that they have done in their careers thus far. So JR is an artist who exhibits freely in the streets of the world, catching the attention of people who are not typical museum visitors. After finding a camera in the Paris metro in 2001, JR has traveled worldwide to create some of the most iconic art projects of the last decade. In 2006, he created Portrait of a Generation. These were images of suburban men and women that he posted in huge formats in the bourgeois districts of Paris. In 2007, with Marco, he made Face to Face, which has been called the biggest illegal exhibition ever, and it consisted of huge portraits of Israelis and Palestinians face to face and eight Palestinian and Israeli cities. In 2011, JR received the TED Prize, after which he created Inside Out, an international participatory art project that allows people worldwide to get their picture taken and pasted to support an idea and share their experience. In 2016, JR was invited by the Louvre and made the famous dis uh, pyramid disappear through a surprising anamorphosis. And that same year, he worked with Rio during the 2016 Olympics and created new gigantic sculptural installations above the city using scaffolding that featured athletes and highlighted the beauty of athletic movement. Just this past year, JR co-directed Faces Places, a film with Agnes Varda, and this featured the two of them traveling around France to meet people and discuss their visions. The film, as you may have known, was nominated for, nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary. Jeffrey Deitch has been involved with modern and contemporary art for nearly 50 years, and has had one of the most dynamic careers in the art world as an artist, writer, curator, dealer, and advisor. He started working in galleries in 1974 at the John Weber Gallery, working with some of the leading artists of the era, such as Saul LeWitt, Carl Andre, Dan Flavin, Robert Ryman, and Hans Hacke. In 1976, he surprised his art world friends by enrolling at Harvard Business School, which led, him, led to him eventually developing and co-managing Citibank's Art Advisory Service, the first professional art advisory service of its type and the first department in a major bank to specialize in art finance. In 1988, after nine years at Citibank, he opened his own art advisory firm, and he continues to advise some of the world's most active collectors of modern and contemporary art. Deitch has written numerous articles, monographs, and catalog essays on artists spanning from Fernand Leger to Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Jeff Koons. And in the 1970s and early 1980s, he was a regular contributor to arts and art in America. He's been especially engaged with artists who have emerged from street and graffiti culture, and has been a primary critical and commercial voice for Basquiat, Herring, and Coons. Deitch project, Projects, the New York Gallery he operated from 1996 to 2010, presented more than 250 projects by artists from 33 countries, and its history has recently been documented in Live the Art, 15 Years of Deitch Projects, that was published by Rizzoli in 2014. In 2010, Deitch closed the gallery to become director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. During his three years at MoCA, he presented 50 exhibitions and projects, including The Painting Factory and Art in the Streets, which had the uh, highest attendance in the museum's history. Deitch has reestablished his art advisory service and exhibition program in New York at present and will be opening a Los Angeles gallery in September of this year. So we are here today to discuss JR's installation so close, but also to expand on and discuss JR's work in general, Jeffrey Deitch's involvement with it, and Deitch's reflections on decades of work with quote unquote art in the streets. After that, we'll have a chance to open it up to some questions, as I'm sure there will be some. And if you're using social media, uh, we're using the hashtag so close armory. So I'm gonna move to the chairs. Hello? Yes. Okay. Hi, Jared. Hey. Hi, Jared. Um, so, Jared, can you talk to us a little bit about what So Close is and uh, describe it in a little bit of detail, what it is, both image-wise and structurally, and the origin of this work? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to work with you, Jeffrey. Uh, so. Yeah, 
tell you where circles come from. Actually, a friend of mine gave me a book, uh, must have been six years ago, from Stephen Wilkers, who is actually in this room today, and he uh, is right there. And uh, uh, an amazing book, actually, where you would see the complete abundant side of Ellis Island, the side that have never been open to the public. And I remember seeing this book and be like, wow, what a, you know, what a fascinating place. And that shows a lot of how I walk. I don't necessarily wait for invitation. When I got this book and I saw this walk, I contacted Ellis Island and I said, how can I get there? And, uh, and I said, oh no, it's closed. You cannot get there. Uh, I still got a meeting. And uh, at that meeting, you know, we actually said, explain, you know, ideally we would get archive photos. You know, I was happy to do it and pay it on my own. Or, just, you know, I, uh, living in New York, I could just come easily and do the project. And it took five years to get the authorization. <laughs> so I actually paste in the abundant side of Ellis Island. That's one image, um, this one's another, because on that whole section, there is still all the furniture. It actually is exactly intact, like it had been left since they closed Ellis Island. So you really feel the presence of the millions of people who have come through there, and all the people who actually didn't make it because you would get to that section of the island uh, when you were sick or uh, they didn't know, you know, um, if you needed to be put in quarantine and you would be put there and you would be so close from your goal because, you know, no. right there is the Statue of Liberty and, you know, um, you would arrive on the boat, those pastings are still on the island actually, it's tours that you can do, it's called the Hard Hat Tours uh, and you have you, you, you book online and they put two guards with you and it's a group of eight people and you can walk to those ruins. But you would be so close from the city and yet so far a lot of people had to go back all the way. So that's how, you know, I had to walk on Ellis Island for years and it's been fascinating because um, I shot a small film uh, that we gave for free and shared with everyone. Uh, we've done many projects uh, talking also about current migrants. This is this was for the film, so this was inside, was a, you know temporary installation, so it had to go. But last year, um, I got invited to exhibit for the first time outside of Ellis Island, and you know really the team there is amazing. Uh, uh, they've never let any artists do any work on that side, so I felt really privileged. We opened it to the people. And when I got invited, of course, to paste on the outside, I wanted to paste photos of current migrants. Because I felt like I pasted the photos in the archive of Ellis Island. And, you know, I wanted to talk about the people of today, the people who are trying to make it here and, uh, and, and who can't anymore. And so I proposed an image with some eyes that would be on the outside so that you know, people who pass on boat, it's millions of people who go to the Statue of Liberty, who goes to Staten Island, who would see it. And it got refused. Uh, so I was like, well, you know, I mean, it's just eyes. What is the difference? Let me show you a crop of an eye from 1900 and a crop of an eye from today. It's the same, you know. And so they said, no, we can only do the archive photo because this is governmental. So I said, okay, let me see. I flew to the border of Syria with the photo, a famous photo from the archive that's actually in public domain, and uh, which is a group of seven or eight migrants, you know, uh, lined up to, uh, you know, enter uh, to Ellis Island, uh, the United States of America. And so I entered through Jordania, the border of Syria, and got to the camp. And I entered the camp and I, I said, can I meet anybody who looks like those people? Is anyone that look like this guy or look at this woman? And right away, people say, oh, that's, that's funny. That, that guy actually, there's a guy who sells chicken all the other way at the camp. He actually looked like that. And that woman could be my aunt. And then they took me and then, like, we spent a couple of days, like, finding people. And when I would find them, and I would explain them. And I would say, do you mind if I take your photo? But you have to pose exactly in the same shape as that person was, you know, posing. And so people say, of course, but what do you want to do with it? They say, look. I want to replace your face by their face, and I want to see if, if I show them that photo, they, they'll see any difference. So the people say, of course, if that helps, uh, we do. So I photographed those eight people and replaced the faces, which is something I never do. You have to know something about my work. There have never been any Photoshop in the history of my work. If not, if I start doing it, you would doubt any image you would see. 
But I thought one thing it needed to be done, and second, I've never lied on an image. I don't like, you know, uh, yes, I do stuff illegally, but I don't try to create polemic. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, you catch me in the street, I'm not gonna say, I didn't do it, I don't know, I haven't seen the people. I, yeah, I've done it. Um, so anyway, I came back, sent the photo to Ellis Island, and said, okay, that's what I wanna paste. And they said, oh, amazing, yes, sure. Uh, we'll put it on the outside. <laughs> like, okay, I can only do it next week. So they said, cool. Went there, put the scaffolding with the team, we started pasting, and uh, installed the walk. And, um, and everyone was like, great, amazing. They, you know, you couldn't be more close than that. We were all there looking at, and no one saw the difference. The people who know the best image haven't seen the difference. I haven't announced it anywhere, this was last year. <laughs> It stayed there for six months, millions of people passing from. Mm. That's it, I didn't try to make any like, wow, I made it, we pasted it, that it was there and it disappeared. And it's only last week that we revealed it on 60 Minutes, uh, now that it's all gone and that the, you know, the rain had washed it away, and that we installed it you know, in front of the Amory, so this is the actual image. And that's why we wanted to present it here, that's why also the title of the show is called So Close. So is this the actual image that was on Ellis Island or slightly different? No, it's the actual exact image. Okay, so you're just transplanting that image here. And so were there any issues, like, I mean, the way that this is presented is, is on scaffolding, and that's something that's new for you, relatively. I, 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 I have to admit I stole that idea to the North Korean, because I went in North Korea and uh, four years ago, and uh, that's the, the advantage of being anonymous, is you can take off your hat and glasses and travel on different passports, and then if they don't look at your police records, you're just, you know, <laughs> nobody. So I said I was working in a marketing agency in Switzerland, and I was, you know, in charge of promotions, and, and, and then first they refused it, but I was like, oh, I cannot get better than that, I don't know where, so I reapplied, and it got approved. So, of course, I, you know, that's the kind of places where you know, I realized that that's where the limit is. You know, a lot of places I would tell you, it's not where you think it is, the limit is much further. When I went there, I thought, okay, that's where the limit is. I, 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 I actually pasted something the size of the top of my finger, and I'm really proud of that, but it might be my smallest pasting, but at least it is in North Korea. <laughs> but on my way back, I saw the main square, this giant, you know, really like propaganda image on scaffolding, um, of a cut out, so it looked like billboard, but it's not advertising anything except, you know, the dictator. And so uh, I was like, wow, that's pretty powerful. And I started doing those uh, sculpture installation, like you mentioned, in Brazil and uh, in different parts. And so I, that's why I wanted to present it this way to you know, you know, uh, not paste them on the building, but like play with the architecture. And, and you know, sometimes I can have like the one in Brazil, someone jump over a building. And uh, certainly that becomes possible. Right. Um, Jeffrey, can you talk a little bit about your involvement in this project and then also just how you got to work with JR? Here, well, first, it's such a privilege to work with JR. JR is the kind of artist I admire the most because JR makes art for the world. He doesn't make art just for art fairs, <laughs> though we're here, and this is an important audience too but it's really art for everybody. And also, JR is one of the few artists who, with great integrity, can make art that takes on the important issues of today without being overly hectoring and continuing vanguard art tradition. Also, as you can see, JR is a great communicator and you know, very special. There's the rare artist who, in his personality, attitude, embodies the work and can push the work even beyond with his ability to articulate it. So we've known each other for a long time. It's one of you, you told me your first trip to New York, you came to my gallery. I didn't mention you, I just dropped a book on his, on, you know, on his, on his table hoping one day he'll see it. And when was that? Uh, first time I came was 2004. And so we were able to work together to do a terrific project at the Art in the Streets show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. JR pasted faces across the entire facade of the museum. It was a fantastic piece. And 
we did other things as well. And we've, we've done some public commissions for buildings in New York City. But we never did a big project like this. And when the Armory Show asked me, do you have an idea about something special that can engage the public, that can be outdoors, indoors, JR was the one. Thank you, Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, you've worked with some, you know, some of the most amazing kind of street, urban, graffiti artists of the era, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see JR in the context of others you've worked with. So something very interesting about street art, that the original originators of wild style, and my hero, Lee Canonis, is right here in the front row. <laughs> So their, their, their innovations were so strong and profound, it was very hard for many years for artists working the public in this way to do something new. And so you see all over the world, artists working in the style that Lee initiated in New York City in the late 70s. Uh, so I thought for a while, graffiti art got a little stale, repetitive. And so I was looking for people who were working in the street, uncommissioned public art, people who don't ask permission to just do it on their own, but doing it in a way that was fresh. And JR is one of the people I came across who reinvented how to create this kind of public art. And in addition, there's another very important innovation. Uh, I think that JR is one of the artists extending how you can use the medium of photography. Yeah. And uh, I, I think extending it in a more interesting way than any other person using photography today. And maybe that's a good, uh, good moment to kind of talk about Faces Places. If anyone has not seen that movie, you should. I think it's now out on iTunes as of this week. Um, but I was really struck in that film about how exactly what Jeffrey's talking about, how it really illustrates the, the various different ways in which you use the photograph. First, going from photographs that you've taken to photographs that you set up that people, you know, kind of collaborate with you on them. And then you have your, your truck that drives around the countryside, uh, sort of photograph, a uh, uh, camera on wheels. Um, <laughs> uh, up, right there. Yeah. So, uh, can you just tell people a little bit about the movie, kind of a little teaser, so they'll go yeah. see it, which I think everyone should? Um, so I met Anya Svata, who's right there with the funny haircut, <laughs> uh, which I encourage everybody to do because it's pretty simple to do, but also it changed, you know, how people see you, and they, they can tell there's some fun in you, you know, when you have such a haircut. So, Anya is definitely someone that knows how to embody that. And so, we actually never met, uh, and I knew her work in French, she's kind of a master of cinema, and also in the US, but you know, I realized a lot of my generation didn't know her, and, um, and I knew her, I've seen her films, but I've never met, we've never been in the same room, and one day, just an email came, and her daughter said, oh, would you like to meet my mom? And I was like, wow, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll come. So I, I, I went there the next day, it was a Monday, and you know, she prepared some little cookies and pastramis and like some, you know, stuff that, you know, grandma does at home and, and showed me her photos and I, I had my phone only with me, I wanted to take a photo, I took one and then she said, oh, you can do better. I was like, I know, I'm sorry, you know. It's like, well, why, don't you, why don't you come to my studio? And she's like, okay, sure, you know, well, I don't know, I'm here now, so come tomorrow. Okay. Then she came the next day and I remember she came and my studio is always, you know, with the team and friends are coming by always hectic and she just chilled there the whole day and talked to everyone and um, that day it was funny it was the, 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 the rapper uh, Yasin Bey Mosdev was there and you know he can be really like intense and she actually like boom backpicked him and started talking to him and I look at those two and I said wow she's in you know she's like camouflage she can be and like talk to anybody anytime and 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 and, and turn to um, their perspective you know, and I mean, it was fascinating to see. So the next day I went back to her house and we, you know, we kind of felt both that we had friendship at first sight, really. Uh -huh. So we were like, we should do something. 
but she didn't want to do any more movie in her life. She actually never co-directed or co-written in her life, and I was not planning to make any movie. So we just said, why don't we do, you know, an art film, like a one-minute piece, a two-minute film, or five minutes, and that's how we started. We actually raised money online and went on the road, and we took, you know, my photo booth truck that amazed her because it, you know, it prints the photo right away. And we drove to France, and you know that's one of the first things we did, like stop in a village and had no idea and say, oh, you know we had bread, so why don't we do a picture with the whole village, you know, eating the baguette? You know that's when you put French people in the village with no idea that what come out. But that's exactly what it. And then we went to factories and uh, uh, you know involve everybody there, but it was interesting because because we were so naive and didn't know the whole context of the factory, for example, a lot of people told us after, they said, you know, we don't like this group of the people, we don't like this guy, or this is, we all different sections, and, but because we just were, wanted to involve everyone, we actually overpassed that, and the people for the art project also overpassed that, overpassed that difference. Wow. And we realized that actually, I was going often in a place in Normandy where I saw that bunker, and it's funny because normally when I see a place that I really want to paste on, I just do it the next week. But this one, for 10 years, it had really, um, you know, I didn't know what to do on it. I was really impressed by that bunker that fell from the cliff. And I was trying to get her there, but she was like, I don't care about your bunker. <laughs> yeah, she's really tough, she's really tough. And I can speak freely today because she's not next to me. If not, she would have stopped me already and I would not be saying your word. I'm gonna enjoy that freedom right now. And, um, and then, uh, you know, one day I was there again and she said, you know, what are you doing there? And I tell her the name of the village and she's like, wow, I know that place. I, I came there in the 50s with Guy Bourdin, a famous photographer, mm -hmm. that's here on the photo, uh, and uh, on that exact same beach. And she'd say, I even went there with my mother when I was seven years old in 1938, so before actually the bunker was built. And so then she came back in 1951 and did those photos. And so, you know, that's another story that we, we crossed past. So anyway, the, the film is a journey through encounters of people all around France. And, um, and you know, and at the same time, she's losing her eyesight. So I'm trying to help her see as much as possible before it all disappears. So, you know, we had an incredible journey. It's an incredible, yeah. That, that wasn't in the film. So exactly. Yeah, just, I'm giving like teaser so people don't leave. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, I, I'd love you both to just talk a little bit about funding for your projects. You know, both of you work with uh, not so normal. I mean, it's not to say that no one else does what you do, but um, not so normal funding uh, strategies. I don't know if you could talk a little bit about your strategy, and Jeffrey, you could talk a little bit about just how your projects have been funded and just how street art kind of, you know, doing really path-breaking kind of installation work out in the world does pose a challenge for support. I mean, so someone's gonna pass with a hat and, uh, you know, everybody can give the donation. That's how going we organize talks. Now, so from the really beginning, because my work implicates people, um, I never wanted to have any corporate sponsors. So there's no brand, there's no sponsors, uh, uh, you know, there's no institution behind it that pays for it. And it was a rule that I set up from the really beginning, because when I went and did one of the early projects in the Middle East, I couldn't paste on the wall between Israel and Palestine or in the cities there, you know, powered by Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. Because on one side they'd be like, you know, we don't like Coca-Cola, and on the other side if I've done it with Meca-Cola, which is, uh, you know, another brand, they'd be like, we don't like that. So it would actually link me with some political ideas that I don't even care. So depending on where the money comes from, it would be a nightmare. So from the really beginning, actually, and also because maybe they didn't want to sponsor me also, but I didn't even try. It was you know, easier to not ask any permission and to just self fund it. So because I don't come from money, I, the, the, you know, I was doing small jobs on the side, non-photography job, because I never studied photography, so I'm not that good. But like, you know, I could unload a truck, I could do other stuff that I would use the money for. And so that's how I really started at the beginning. And it's just black and white photography, you know? So it was, it was pretty small. But then, really quickly I understood that uh, it would be only through the sales of my work that, um, that I could finance the project. But you have to understand that 99% of what I do is actually not for sale it's in the street. Anyone can take photo, anyone can reproduce it the way they want, as long as it's not commercial. We don't sue anybody. The only people we sue actually is the brands who use my artworks as a background in advertising. 
And I can tell you that we actually <laughs> won a lot of cases like that. So sometimes I feel even conflicted about it because I'm suing people that have used on the back of a Volkswagen advertising a pasting that I haven't had permission to put. And yet, you know, uh, like one time they won and they actually changed the face on post production and there was nothing I could do. Anyway, so the way I have financed the work from the beginning was to setting, you know, one percent of my time goes to creating artworks uh, or documentation of the work that's ephemeral and our installation, like uh, there was one, I'm gonna go back, close your eyes, you've seen this, you forgot this, and then maybe you remember that this, and that's the one I wanna show before that one, this one. So that's, for example, a museum piece of 700 trains turning in circle, and it's a museum in, the, in, in, in France, and all those trains connect and create faces. Uh, so there's a smaller installation of that that's actually on the bus here. Uh, and those walks are glass walks so that, you know, depending on how you put the light, it reflects the entire image also on the wall. So walks that I always presented in gallery, walks that I couldn't do in the street, or videos, or that's how I got into film really early, um, or the documentation of the process, uh, a bit like Christo does, you know, like the sketches. And I always mainly done unique piece, you know, or edition of Three to the Max, but I've really produced really rarely. I've done only two shows in my life in France, uh, two shows in the UK, and uh, and you know this is the first time I present a, a major set of work in, the, in in New York. So it's it's been uh, I've basically yeah. sell enough to finance my work, but uh, I've never like you know my first gallery was in Here's London was Banksy and Lazarides yeah. who signed me when I was 22, and they were at the time you know playing the market and doing incredible uh, things, which was amazing to be because right away. You know, I didn't know about the art world, I didn't know about, you know, I've never studied art, so I didn't know that there was all this world around. And, and then the next day, Damien Nurse was buying a piece of mine and stuff. And so it was incredible, but at the same time, I was like, wow, well, I'd rather take my time because I can't, you know, burn that cow twice. That's, that's how I want to finance my work for the rest of my life. I don't want to flip on in 20 years and say, okay, finally, I've done this with, you know, um, you know L'Oreal. Because, you know, they do great stuff, you know, they do great hair <laughs> and whatever. And then I'll be there talking to you about L'Oreal. Who cares, you know? And they came to me many times through their foundations, through their... And I told them, I said, look, those people didn't participate in the project to even, you know, like, talk about L'Oreal Foundation or whatever foundation. So I've been always really careful about that. And, uh, and amazingly, people don't know but when they buy artworks, that's where the money goes. But... Um, a lot of people became shadow philanthropists. Can you believe that in New York I don't pay rent for my studio? Because someone is like, well, if you're going to send posters for free around the world to people, can I at least help you put your printer in a place that you won't pay rent? And it's been seven years. And you meet sometimes people like that who's not doing it for the credit they get out of it, but for the purpose of the actual project. And I call those people shadow philanthropists. And I can tell you that I've met people like that. They exist, they're really rare, but they are the people that to me really Jeffrey, can you talk a little?